Revenue operations is much more than words in a job title. It's a methodology that is transforming sales, marketing, and customer success teams into high-performing revenue drivers. However, many revenue leaders still have critical questions about how to operationalize it. Furthermore, they want to know what others in the industry are doing. That's why we conducted original research and put together our findings in the 2021 Revenue Operations and Customer Acquisition Benchmark Report. In partnership with RevOps Squared, we asked hundreds of cross-departmental revenue leaders across top companies to reveal their approach to revenue planning, analytics and revenue operations, and customer acquisition. We've identified exactly how teams are aligning to hit their revenue targets, as well as the new activity, pipeline, and customer acquisition benchmarks to strive for in 2021 and beyond. Download the entire report for free at ringdna.com slash revopsreport. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more. I used to, when I first became a sales manager, I used to show Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right? Not the whole movie, but A-A-B-B-C closing. Now, I modified that about 10 years to, to my A-B-L advice. A always B B L learning, always be learning and control your own destiny. Hi friends, welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. Now that was Ray Reich, and Ray is the founder and CEO of RevOps Squared, as well as the host of his own podcast, which is titled Metrics That Measure Up. And that's what we're talking about today. Sales metrics, the good, the bad, and the ugly of sales metrics. Which ones work, which ones don't. And we also dive into what are the metrics sales leaders and sellers should be tracking and should be analyzing that actually would move the needle on sales performance. So stick around, lots of good data today. Before we get to Ray, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't done so already, we'd certainly appreciate it if you could also leave us a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Ray, welcome back to the show. Andy, thank you so or much. Welcome to the show. Actually, I, I keep thinking you've been on it, but actually I've been on your show. That is correct. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. This has been one of my, my goals since I started my own podcast career. Thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Uh, and also, we, were, we did a webinar together and all those things. It just feels like you've been here. So anyway, welcome back anyway. So uh, we were going to talk about sales performance metrics today, and I know this is a topic near and dear to your heart. It is, and probably a lot of people would say I'm a little bit too focused on measurements and metrics, but I'm not sure how you manage everything that you don't measure. Yeah, and I, I hopefully we have time to get into it. I, I sort of <laughs> take the position that maybe we're not using data well enough and that there's actually more things we should be measuring that we're not that could actually help sales performance. So, because um, a lot of examples from other f endeavors like professional sports, which is one I keep defaulting to, who are much more sophisticated in their use of data than we are in sales and you know, perhaps have things that we should be aspiring to do or to mimic in some regard that could give us more information about actions we could take that actually have an impact on outcomes. However, at the same time, Andy, we are drowning in data. We've become we data-driven Nazis almost, kind of obsession. And I don't think we're making very smart metrics-informed decisions, but we have plenty of data. I agree 150%. <laughs> so, yes. Um, well, and so why is that? Well, let me put a little bit of a my frame on this, and this came from sure. being trained at GE back in the late 80s, early 90s, and everything needed to be 
all decisions need to be based upon data, mm-hmm. critical thought, and what, how's it aligned to the outcome. So let me start with the outcome. So the SaaS industry, which is what I've been in for almost 20 years, 30 years if you count time sharing, which was the first interpretation of subscription software. Yeah. We have all these industry standard key performance indicators that investors look at. These are things like right. rule of 40, which measures how fast are you growing plus how profitably are you doing at EBITDA. We right. have on customer acquisition, which sales is one of the key departments responsible for, we have things like CAC payback period. CAC payback period measures how long does it take to generate enough operating profit, that's revenue minus your cost of goods sold, until you can pay back that customer acquisition cost, your sales and your marketing cost. Which I'll just jump in and say that, yeah, looking at that particular metric in general, that's, I call that a brute force metric because it's measured in aggregate and not very precisely. But yeah, anyway, go yeah, ahead. It's measured in aggregate. And you could use the word, it's a lagging indicator because and you don't know the CAC ratio until you have a point in time or CAC payback period until you have a point in time where you're measuring revenue mm-hmm. closed and your cost. Mm-hmm. However, Andy, sales performance metrics haven't really changed for decades. Things like yes. quota. And often yep. a sales professional or even a sales manager doesn't really understand how their sales productivity measurements impact the company level performance measurements. There's no direct causal relationship. And I think that's a big failure by CEOs and CFOs in our industry that to not inform the sales organization how their performance metrics directly impact what investors and a board of directors are looking at. Well, give me an example, because I mean, certainly people, yeah, they understand if they don't hit their number, that has an impact on these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, so give me an example of what you mean. Well, let's look at the CAC payback period that we just discussed a minute ago. Sure. Right. Almost sure. everyone who's raising money, whether it's a Series B, Series C, or even maybe Series A and C, a investor will say, how much revenue do you have? How much did it cost to generate that? So they can calculate, if I give you $5 million, right. how much revenue are you going to generate? So you go to sales and you say, okay, your quota is a million dollars. Now, first of all, that salesperson says, well, if I do a million dollars, I know how that may contribute to our new business goal, which is say 10 million, but I have no Mm -hmm. effing idea how it um, correlates to this CAC payback period that I hear is important to us. There's no correlation. Or does that sales rep know wait a minute, they're actually deciding in their executive meetings that if they hand me a million dollars of quota, they know that on average, I'm probably only going to generate 700000 to 800000 I don't think any salesperson knows that the company doesn't depend upon them to hit 100% of quota. Do you? Uh, yeah, you know, if they've been in business, they've been in the sales game more than a couple of years, hopefully they understand that. Um but <laughs> I guess the question is, yeah, why why should the individual seller care? Because it seems like there's other things that should be much more important to them that need to be measured, that need to be improved, that are going to have ultimately have an impact on whether it's CAC payback or Rule 40, whatever. Well, at the end of the day, as an individual contributor, mm-hmm. they're just worried about making quota, right? You're right. That is number one thing, keeping their job and how much compensation do they make. But then they want to become a sales manager, right? A lot of individual contributors, that's their career path. Would you agree with that? Well, I'm sure. But I mean, again, it's like, it's an interesting topic because I was thinking about this a week ago with another conversation I was having with someone is, is, okay, for every hundred salespeople that are hired, and this is, yeah, I'm just throwing this a broad example, how many end up being managers? You would say probably 20%. Maybe Do 25%. We? I mean, I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm asking the question because I have no oh, idea. Because, I mean, I look at, at you know, every organ, sales organization I've been a part of, some that are pretty large and some that were, you know, startup. 
And yeah, certainly no more than 20, but it oftentimes seemed substantially less. Yeah, well, I look at span of control. So I don't have any empirical evidence to say it's 20, Andy. Right. But I'm looking at right. what's the span of control for most sales leaders? Yeah, if it's a enterprise class, traditional field sales, if we still have that, you know, it's one to, it's one <laughs> manager to five to six reps, right? And if it's inside sales, it's kind of one to eight. Yeah, I mean, but again, I think we're going to be in that more, I would say even the outside is more one to eight, and certainly organizations I was in is one to eight to one to 12. Um, yeah, but even there, oftentimes, one so, to eight, that means 12.5% of people need to become managers at some time to manage those eight people, right? So 12.5% right. over time need to be managers. That's the way I do the simple math. Yeah, no, but I was saying is, is to your point about why it's important for sellers to really be cognizant of, of the impact, you know, of them understanding, look, yeah, we don't calculate quota by by taking 10, you know, million dollars times 10 salespeople when we have a $10 million quota. Yeah, yeah, we buffer that. We assume, yeah, you know, X percent won't make it, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah, just wondering, you know, part of the point was, should sellers really be aware about that? And I'm just thinking, yeah, given how few actually go into management, shouldn't we devote more time to helping them really understand metrics around their activities that help them actually perform at a higher level? Yeah, and we'll dive into that, but let me zoom out for a minute, Andy. Sure, um, can sure. We talk a lot about, early career professionals today. And one of the common attributes you see is they need to be part of something bigger than just their job, that they're contributing to mm -hmm. a mission, a vision, or at least understand what the bigger goal is for the entity or organization they're part of. Do you agree with that? Right. Well, I think it, yes, to a degree, right? It's a good question you're asking is, what is that something bigger? And I think for many sellers, that something bigger is, yeah, sort of a, a personal mission, not necessarily a company mission. I think company mission certainly helps. With, you know, they want to work. Yeah, we've seen the statistics that you know, millennials, Gen Zs want to work for companies that have more mission-oriented and so on. But I think the most relevant thing is, is how they feel that mission personally in terms of uh, you know, helping solve problems for, for customers and feeling a part of a solution there. Mm -hmm. So... So I'm going to call a little bit of BS on this whole trend that we go into sales in 2020 or 2021 to help people. I just, that may end up becoming a cause once they're in the role and they realize, oh, I really like helping my customer understand what she's trying to accomplish personally, that aspirational goal or their professional goal and how I can help that. Mm. I agree that's the best salespeople, Andy, I really do. However... I think when people go and look for a job at Salesforce and it's their first or second job, or even if it's their third job and they want to become an enterprise AE at Salesforce, I truly don't believe that they're looking at Salesforce because of how they're changing the world or it has a mission beyond selling software and driving improvement in the sales, marketing, or customer success process. Right? Well, I think for getting the job, absolutely. But I think that one of the things where we have a real problem is we don't help, we don't socialize sellers when we bring them in to say, this is the perspective you need to have. Instead, we give them the perspective is your job is to go persuade somebody to buy this product as opposed to your job is to help a buyer solve a problem. And I think that's fundamental. I mean, I think, yes, it may take time for that to become you know, integrated into the person's approach, the seller's approach to how they approach customers and buyers, but we don't do them any favors by not being very explicit that that is the way they need to perceive what they're doing. And I think this is, I think this is the problem. I think this is part of the reason that we have such high turnover rates among salespeople in part is because they feel so disconnected from the process of what they're trying to do personally. And this is where you get into the qualitative versus the quantitative aspect of sales, right? So I'm a very quantitatively driven person. So you'll look at the very baseline. If you have to create your own pipeline, you look at how much outbound activity the person is doing. And we all measure, oh, you need to have 100 outbound activities a day. And if you have 100 outbound activities, hopefully you have five meaningful conversations. And if you have five conversations, on average, 
0.5 will turn into a scheduled meeting. So we all know that top of the funnel um, transition, right? Or conversion rates. Every, everybody, everybody has their rates. Right. Everybody has their yes. rates. And those are all quantitative. And by the way, if you're going to do a million dollars of revenue, you need to have $3 million of qualified pipeline. And that means you need to have 20 opportunities. We all have those. How often do we sit down and say, let's look at your objectives to say, how many quality conversations are you having per day or per week? And how do we define a quality conversation? I don't, it, even with all the conversational intelligence we have today, Andy, I've never seen one sales leader say, we're going to measure you on quality conversations and look at the conversion rates for a quality conversation versus overall conversations. Do you? I love it. So what's like, what's a quality conversation? And honestly, I don't know. If I hear it, it's one of those things, if I hear it, I'll know. But if you make me step back, Andy, and say, what is a quality conversation? I could start thinking about it and saying, well, it's did you build a personal connection up front? Were you able to ask more questions than you spoke? Did the person you're asking questions to actually answer in a yes, no? Or was it a here's my biggest challenge and here's why it's important to me? So I know it when I hear it, Andy but I can't tell you how to define it up front. Do you think we can do that? Well, I think it's it's a goal, right? Because I think we really want to move the needle. Let's talk about individual sales performance, not because so many of the metrics are collective sales performance metrics, but they arise out of individual performance. And yeah, I don't think we have a very effective way to measure individual performance these days. We just use the, the big hammer of quota. And you and I, I think, may have talked about this in the past, a different venue, is that you know, I, I, th- I have a very specific definition of productivity in sales, which is revenue generated per hour of selling time. And so that is ultimately a measure. And you can measure this both at an individual and a collective level, right? You should, as an organization, instead of the sort of mass aggregate number of CAC that we, you know, sales expenses, marketing expenses, so on, you should be tracking that by account, by opportunity, by customer, meaning we have certainly have the ability to track, you know, say on a deal that you put together, a complex deal, you have a salesperson's time, a sales engineer's time, rev ops time, marketing's time, uh, sales frontline sales manager, maybe CRO's time, that contribute to the deal. You should be understanding that. Plus, if you're you know, part of, let's say, coming from an ABM program, you know what your marketing spend is against that account. Now you know that is your CAC for that account. We should be doing this at the account level and then take it down to the individual level. How much time do you have to invest as an individual to move an opportunity from initial point of interest or your first point of engagement to a close? So... You think we should get down to tracking an individual sales professional's time, how they spend time on, how many times they spend talking to a customer opportunity, how much yep. time they spend yep. researching the opportunity, how much time they spend yep. crafting the email that got them the initial meeting. You think we should get to that granular unit of work measurement? Absolutely. It's the only way we can do true capacity planning for an organization. Because if you know that your sellers, an individual seller, or you have this, what I call a productivity factor for every seller, then you can say, look, based on number of hour, available hours in a year, I have a much better sense of how much they can actually produce than saying some multiple and some you know, buffer on, a, on adding a bunch of quotas together. Because the trouble with quota yeah, is there's a thing called Goodhart's Law that's been proven out mathematically is when a measure becomes a target, it loses all value as a measure mm-hmm. because you optimize your process to achieve the measure. So we're, we're setting up self-fulfilling prophecies for quota by saying, here's the target, go optimize your, pro- your process to hit that target, as opposed to saying, let's look at how we can help this person become more effective every time they interact with buyers so that the number of hours they have to spend plus is becomes reduced as well as help them become more effective 
working even the internal organization and what resources they need to call internally. So the total hours that we have to invest to close the deal goes down. And it gives us more time to go work on other opportunities. You know, I learned about Goodhart's Law from you. And I, I became very enamored. So I went in, I tried to do all my research, right? All the way back to what, what's an economist, right? Why did he come up with that law, right. et cetera? So, but hours, how many hours do you need to spend to close a deal, right? Or hours per dollar of revenue. If that becomes the measure, it loses all its value, right? It's the same thing. Anything. Well, no, because it's, it's, it's not a target. It's just a result. You're not putting a target on it. You're saying this is what is. So I would rather provide somebody an incentive to become more productive, meaning how can you get my job accomplished in less time? How can I become more effective with the questions I ask? How can I be more effective in undertaking the time to understand what the customer is really trying to say, you know, build the relationships, whatever? Those are, those are the moments that matter, that move the needle forward, and we need to be able to find a way to measure those, the effectiveness of those. And so I believe the way to do that is to say, look, let's look at the amount of time it takes. Because you, know, you may find, and I've, now here's the key, I've managed teams this way decades ago because we were operating in an environment where uh, the company did some a fair amount of defense work, right? So we had to capture everybody's hours. Everybody in the company had to capture hours. They had to charge their time to specific jobs. And this was, you know, before we had the benefit of, of some <laughs> of the last 10 or 20 year technology, we were doing this all in Excel, basically. Right. But this was a pretty good size enterprise. And if you were a salesperson, you had a qualified opportunity, we put a job number to it. And you, anybody that contributed to making that job, that customer deal, charge their time to that job. So I understand. I just think I have a different mathematical formula for this. So let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. And sure. let's anchor it back in conversations. We tell every sales professional, you need to have this many activities to get this many conversations. That's pretty standard, right? Well, and I have a, yeah, I have a fundamental problem with that. I think we tell people they need to have they need to have a certain number of outcomes, and I think part of our problem today is we dictate the number of activities they need to have when we need to f enable people to have their own. Everybody has a ratio. I agree. Everybody has their own set of numbers. They should be unique to the individual. We shouldn't be forcing them to do a standard set. But anyway, go ahead. So I'm going to go to conversations right now. There's some benchmark data that says if it's a cold outreach, you've never spoken to this person before but they get on the phone, that if you're best in class, 10% of those conversations will convert into a scheduled meeting. And if it's a warm, you've had a previous, at least one previous conversation, mm -hmm. that, um, I'm sorry, I messed up the data. If it's a cold, it's one in 20. If it's warm, it's one in 10, 10%. So, Andy, I, I think we're agreeing here. I would rather say for that cold call, I'd rather find a way to get it from 1 in 20 becomes a meeting to how do you get that to 1 in 10. And let's look at the aspects of that conversation that's going to double your conversion rate. I think we're saying the same thing, right? Sure. Though I'm extending it because I would say, you know, there's a, <clears throat> a young man named Evan Patterson works for uh, Reprise. And <clears throat> you know, posted on LinkedIn and I a couple weeks ago about this is he's killing it, setting meetings, more than hitting his number. And I've talked to his VP, Joe Caprio, about this. <laughs> and so I know it's true. He's not making any calls at all. Yeah, you know, he's doing it through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. He's doing it through, yeah, other think processes, he's being more creative. And so it's like, this is what I'm really talking about. Is, yeah, it could be one in ten for Joe, but for Evan. Something completely different. Yeah. And so, I, and I think in this case, what I'm saying is the measures that we use are so focused on these, you know, standard ways of doing it is we need to broaden the possibilities. And I think this is, I think, quite frankly, this is holding us back.
Yeah. This is a, it's an intellectually stimulating conversation because it shows how you can have very different perspectives, uh, like Evan. Right. So Evan's really good at engaging on social media. There are certain things I'm like, I don't think we can take Evan and say, well, let's just make everybody like Evan, where he's going to be able to, no. everyone's going to be able to do that. My point was, en enable the Evans who can do it, let them do it. That's not what's happening. Because he could work in some organizations, so just tell them, stop that shit. You can't do that. You got to do what we want you to do. And that's oh. more the rule than the not, as you know. You know, Andy, I might actually be part of the problem versus part of the solution because when I go in and talk <laughs> to my clients, right, we talk about what their company level measurements are, right? CAC payback mm -hmm. period, rule 40, net dollar retention. And then I look at, okay, now let's cascade that down into what is the marketing KPIs that they should have to contribute to that or your mm -hmm. sales KPIs. And I believe it's almost like the OKRs, which were first made famous by Andy Grove at Intel, right. objectives and key results, and then John Doerr kind of introduced them to Google. Um, you need to make sure that everyone's objectives are linked and you have key results that directly impact their objective, right? Mm -hmm. So I cascade them down. And when I get to individual sales reps or to an SDR, I'm like, okay, sales rep, you have a million dollar quota. You have $200,000 quota for Q1. I then say, what type of pipeline are you going to need to self-generate, whether it's one quarter before, two quarter before, based upon their sell cycle? So that becomes one of their objectives. The second objective becomes, okay, if we want to have less pipeline coverage ratio, let's get you from a 22% close rate up to a 27% close rate. So I am actually... Mm -hmm. Um, helping companies force objectives at the SDR and AE level that link all the way back up to CAC payback period and operating profit. So I may be mm -hmm. focused on the wrong stuff. I'm more focused on the quantitative aspect of measurement versus the qualitative. So consultants like me could be the problem, Andy. I'm serious. <laughs> well, unlikely, but it's possible. I mean, I think that that... What's what you see happening? I see happening in SaaS is you know become so wedded to the playbooks that people you know manage from what I call position of fear. Basically, is that they're afraid to give people the latitude to do something different because they're afraid of what might or might not happen. And and I think this contributes to part of this, this culture that I called of being accepting of low win rates, for instance. You know, I saw something posted online by somebody who I'm sure you know not that long ago saying, hey, if you're really being successful, you want your win rate to drop because that's a sign that you're, you're working enough opportunities. And this <laughs> is a pretty well-known voice in, in the field. I'm sitting there thinking, well, that's just complete and utter BS. But it's the way it's symptomatic the way we look at things, which is I believe that when you grow a sales team and your process, what you want to do is you want to engineer the process to achieve a certain outcome. And to me, that's going to be a certain win rate. Because to me, win rates are indicative of how effective you are dealing with your buyers. It's their referendum on whether you've you've done a good job, right? So I don't know what an ideal win rate is because it will vary from situation to situation. But if you're as you know, SaaS or aggregates congregates around that you know twenty percent range, and win rate for me being defined as percent win out of your qualified opportunities in your pipeline, is if you're only winning one of every five, you're fundamentally doing something badly, right? What's saying is that you don't have product market fit. If you can only convince one of every five of your most highly qualified prospects that you're the best solution to the problems and the outcomes they're trying to achieve. Well, so so, so I believe that you do is you you engineer your process to start with a win rate in mind. And you get some experience. You know, it's like sort of the theory of constraints. You know, you identify your constraints, you address them, then you move on to the next one. Is do that. And so if you say, look, what we really want is we want a 30% win rate. 
what's that look like in terms of the type of prospects we bring in? What's that do to affect how the process we use to market to them and to identify them and bring them into range, right? So we can engage them in conversation. And you know, ABM certainly is one approach that should result in higher win rates for companies that do it appropriately. But I just get frustrated when people is like, yeah, you know, like this guy said, it's like, yeah, if you're really getting good, your win rates should drop. And it's like, that's nuts. All right, I mean, another guy in the show who's, who I really admire, again, we just have a different opinion. He says, well, the problem is when you're working big deals, uh, or no, when you're trying to get your win rate up, that's problematic because to win, you need to invest more time in every opportunity. And I was like, first of all, no, <laughs> you don't have to. It does not, it's not a fact that you have to invest more time in deals that you win than deals that you lose. Well, I think there's three primary input variables to a salesperson's productivity. So number one, it is close rate, right? If you know, hmm? on average, I'm going to close 30%, right? You know how you're going to spend your time. So that's you're one. Saying close, you're saying close, not win. Um, the close one rate. So the win rate, the win rate. What's so, a win rate? Right. Number one. Number two, what's your average contract value? Because mm -hmm. if you can take your average contract value from $50,000 to $75,000 based upon your techniques, your value proposition messaging, everything you do to manage yep. the buying process, right, you're going to have a higher achievement rate. And number three, I look at sales cycle length. Because I truly don't believe you can say, well, we're averaging 128 days, so I just got to be at 128 days. No. It's like, how can I get it to 100 days? Or 90 days. So those three things can dramatically impact sales productivity. Agreed? Except for the last one. Ah. So. Because, because again, from my perspective, a sales cycle is not a duration. It's a quantity. Explain that. I don't, I don't understand that. It's the number of hours you have to spend to move somebody from initial point of interest to a win. So that, right, that's hours. That's not duration. And well, so oftentimes we extend the duration as sellers because of actions that we take or don't take. There's no reason that those hours have to take place within 120 days. You might be able to have those hours take. I don't see. I, I come from the perspective in my experiences that, you know, customers by and large, unless it's a procurement, they're not setting out to spend, you know, 180 days to make a decision on something they, if they had the right information and understanding, they could make a decision in half that time. And I agree. And if you believe in all the research, it says 60 to 70% of the buying process is completed before they engage with the salesperson, right? So that means... Uh, yeah, I don't buy that. Because I, what I do, what I recommend to my clients is you need to, and I always did this in my own operating roles, I looked at inbound marketing generated leads versus outbound generated through the sales development or the um, AEs. And I measured those sales cycle lengths and close rates independently. And of mm -hmm. course, you can imagine if you do that, you're going to find the closed rate on inbound is anywhere from 20 to 50% higher. 20 to 50% higher. Why is the win rate so much higher? Because a significant less amount ends up in closed, lost, no decision. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just smiling because I remember being on a webinar, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, where somebody claimed using the same data, or not the same data, but the sort of the same scenarios, claimed to have data to show that it was just the opposite, that the win rates on outbound were substantially higher than on inbound. And not only that, but the average contract value on, on deals that originate outbound were substantially higher. Now, I, I told the guy, I said, you can't say that because first of all, it's just not true. <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I don't... I don't yeah, it may be more true what you're saying, uh, that you know, they close, they win more often and so on. I, I tend to believe that's more the case. But yeah, and I just said I didn't agree that that I just put a spin on what you're saying. It's not that to me, it's not that 60 to 70 percent happens before they first engage with a, a seller. I think it's that 60 to 70 percent of it 
you know, takes place, if not more, it takes place out of view of the seller. Mm. Well, I'm just thinking about, you know, I always think about all the data and research I've seen. Yeah. And I think this was Gartner research when they say that once a buyer engages with a sales organization, I thought... I think, I think it was... Ser- actually, I think it was serious decisions that... that oh, well, where they said they only spend about 4% of their time with the vendor sales organization? I think that's Gartner, yeah. That, and yes, it's... Yeah. yeah. And that's so... And that gets back to my point about the importance of being able to measure, and you brought it up too. How do you measure the quality of an interaction, a sales interaction? Because, yeah, when you have so little opportunity to actually interact with the buyer... We need to be making sure that those things are the most effective interactions that you can be. And this is what, you know, part of what <laughs> drives me nuts about, you know, we say we've got sales roles. We call them closers. I remember I was reading something, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, somebody was talking about this one metric. I forget which one it was. It was in an article I was reading. The quote was, this metric allows us to evaluate our sales team's ability to close. And I'm sitting there going, that's not the point. We before you get to a close, we got to measure their ability to sell. And this seems to be the thing we just want to glom right over. It's like, you know, we got SDRs, we got closers. Well, that's the problem. We need sellers, we don't need closers. We need people who can help people understand the problem they're trying to solve, help them evaluate their alternatives, help them choose us as the preferred solution. Then we can close. And let me ask you this, conversational intelligence, right? Hmm? And it's right we now can kind of listen to intonation, talk time between buyers and sellers, types of questions asked, open-ended versus mm-hmm. closed-ended. Um, and I think we could probably find real clues of what makes a salesperson more effective and productive than another. So I agree with that. Mm-hmm. What I don't agree with is that a manager can listen to a conversation and objectively say, one, two, three things, if you did differently, you would be more productive because each person is a different person. Yep. My bias as the manager is what worked for me. You should do what works for me, right? And yep. I saw a Gong research report the other day, and I was blown away. They said, well, if you curse one to two times during the initial sales call, you, this will be true. I'm like, are you trying to trigger me? <laughs> But that's what Kong says. This is what our CI is telling us. Yeah, it's bullshit. And it has nothing, exactly. to, do with, it has nothing to do with Gong being a competitor. It's just, it's just that we, we're so sloppy in the way we use this data, right? And, and this is the thing that we, we sort of are prefacing, talking about, is, is using data more effectively. Is, you know, we look at research reports like this, and there's no context to the data. Right? I mean, there's all these missing pieces, right? Who are you talking to? You talk to a man or a woman? What size deal is it? You talking to a small business owner, mid-sized business? You're talking to an enterprise buyer. I could I could list 20 variables that would have an impact on that. And yet we we'd scoop up all this data and draw these grand conclusions that are worthless. And yet, yeah, you know, yeah, that's great clickbait. And I admire them for their marketing prowess and putting out the clickbait, but it's a useless piece of information. And going back to the the basis of this conversation, I yeah. think 80, 90 percent of the data we gather and the metrics that we um, measure are useless. Yeah. And I'll give you another example. Um, people get so focused on my gross dollar retention or my retention. That's my biggest issue. So I've got to go from an 82 percent retention to 88 this year. But what they don't look at is, well, how's that impacted by what customers I acquire? What cohorts are more prone to um, retention churn? or churn? Or, right. or well, wait a minute, my gross retention is low because I use a product-led growth uh, motion, but my net dollar retention, i.e. the upsells and mm-hmm. cross-sells, are off the charts. So even though my gross dollar is 82, my net dollar is 128%, and I'm in the top 10 percentile. So I don't think we, well, I think the other thing we make a mistake on is we focus on one measurement or one metric at the expense of others. Huge issue in yeah. companies today. 
Yeah, well, I, I think that's that seems to be clear. I mean, I'd read an article saying the five top metrics, some survey that was done, that sales teams track are customer lifetime value, CAC, customer acquisition cost, conversion rate, MRR, and monthly active users. Top wow. five. Mm-hmm. And the question, like in our benchmark index, we're creating this company score, Andy. Mm-hmm. And one of our biggest challenges has been what weight do we put on to different metrics, right? right? How much do you weight customer acquisition cost efficiency versus retention efficiency versus gross margin? So what did we do? We went out and talked to about 60 venture capital firms and said, we're trying to create this company score based upon all these industry standards. Right. How would you weight it? Guess what? There was almost no consistency. <laughs> there were some directional trends, right. but it's all based upon well, what's my portfolio of companies look like? What's their ACV? What's my customer acquisition motion, et cetera? So it's a it's a big issue out there. Too much data. Well, but I think to a point that we I touched on early on, I wanted to get to is is how we use the data. I said I think we we lag in sales because we're looking at these gross these gross metrics, and so <laughs> as my audience knows, I'm a big soccer fan, and I give soccer examples quite often. And soccer is very advanced when it comes to use of analytics. Um, And so what they use analytics for is to help them learn how to score more goals, right? And and so one of the popular metrics they follow is this factor called expected goal. And so for every shot that's taken – uh, it's scored. It's given an expected goal factor. And so it could be based on distance from the goal, angle from the goal, left foot, right foot, header. I mean, there's all these variables that factor into it. And so then, you know, the coaches know is, okay, based on how we set up the team, the players we have, the team we're playing against, because they have uh, sort of an inverse metric which is <laughs> expected goals or goals against expected goals against in terms of you know where their weaknesses are and they put together their game plan to say look we're trying to get the ball into certain areas at certain times with the feet of certain players because we're going to increase our likelihood of scoring a goal and it's like well we're gathering all this data about sales why can't we come up with the equivalent analysis right to say look if you as a seller get into this situation with this type of customer, and these are the various options you can present, you know, A will give you an expected outcome or expected win, let's say, of you know, X percent, and the other will give you an expected win of another percent. Make a choice. It seems like we have getting very close, but we have to be more th- creative in how we use this data to give our sellers information in the moment that can help them make better choices and to help buyers make better choices. One of the best conversations I've had in a long time was around the concept of quality of opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. What are the input variables that are most predictive of a higher close rate? Right. And with today's technology, we can take even event or activity-based inputs like how many emails have you exchanged with that prospect over the last yep. week? two weeks, four weeks, or how many meetings have we had and what was the title of the attendees three exactly. months before the projected close too. If we can actually make that a systemic, repeatable process, I think the whole game changes. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I think I think we just have to think more creatively about it. And I said, get away from these, these like I said, aggregate metrics and look at the individual, because they build up, ultimately, they build up to the aggregate metrics. So let's spend more time focused on the individuals. And, yeah, you know, this gets back to, yeah, let's use technologies like conversational intelligence to do better coaching, to help our people get, you know, we have to make our, we have to coach our coaches to be more sophisticated in how they use this information in a way that, that helps people become more productive in those moments that matter with, with buyers. Yeah. Well, Earlier in this conversation, you mentioned something, and I just have to get it out on this conversation, right? <laughs> sure. And that is like, why don't we spend more time on the qualitative, et cetera? Right. And the issue is 
14 to 18 months of a life cycle of VPS cells in this industry, <laughs> right? So if you look at ramp time, right? Because you can really measure what impacts ramp time productivity, yep. whether it's certain cells enablement techniques, mm -hmm. kind of repetition of telling the story, et cetera. Right. So it's going to be six months on average for an inside sales that's doing over $25,000 deals to get to full productivity is measured by first deal, second deal, first month at quota. Okay? Okay. So now, and we're letting that person say, I'm not going to do 100 outreaches a day, or I'm not going to have a 4X pipeline to quota coverage ratio. I'm going to have much higher quality conversations, Mr. Director of Sales or Ms. VP of Sales. And they're like, okay, I believe you. I see the quality of your outbounds. I see that the, you're converting um, conversations in a meeting or conversations to opportunities higher than anyone I see. But that takes another quarter to two quarters to prove out mm -hmm. with closes, right? Well, I know where you're going. Yes, I, uh, yes, go ahead. By the time you prove this new stuff out, you're fired. Yeah. And even if that person becomes the top superstar six or 12 months later into their career, right? But what happens, though, is they're getting fired doing the stuff that everybody else has been doing, right? This 18-month this tenure for CROs, they're, doing, they're playing the playbook. They yeah. Are, and they're getting fired anyway. So... Something needs to change. Right. And I must admit, and for your listeners today, I'm not sure I have the answer of what needs to change beyond more patience, right, by the investors. And we're not going to be changing that in a venture capital <laughs> influence <laughs> industry, right? We're not. Possibly so. Possibly so. So so I go back to there's certain benchmarks and metrics that we should continue to use coupled with more of the qualitative analysis we can use from today's technology like CI, and which requires better coaching, which yeah. is a discussion you and I had. We don't have very many managers who are great coaches. Well, we don't enable them to be ones, to be good coaches. I mean, this is, yeah, we spend a whole separate conversation, which, again, you know, I've brought up on, on this show many times, is... is and I say this, some people think I'm facetious when I say it. I'm, I'm really kind of serious when I say this. Is Right now, the estimates roughly I've read, $20 billion a year roughly spent on sales training in the United States, of which, what, maybe 10% gets spent on training sales managers. Mm -hmm. I say flip it. Spend 90% on coaching, on training managers, and enabling them to become more effective coaches. Because... The research I've read says that the single most effective thing you can do to improve the performance of individual contributors is more effective coaching. So, so let's let's change how we invest and maybe a little less sales training and more training for coaches and managers to enable them to be the resource the individual sellers need to get better. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. And where I grew up, right, sales management was a real investment that my first company made. Mm -hmm. And I went to a month of sales management coaching training every year. It wasn't a month in a row. It's one week, have some on-the-job training yep. that you go and apply these techniques. And then we did 360 reviews. Was Were we applying those techniques? But they knew it was a journey. It was a two-, three-, four-year journey before I would become a really good frontline sales manager, yeah. right? And then you become a director. Yeah, now the presumption is you're you're a good seller, you understand the metrics, we're going to promote you, just focus on the metrics, don't worry about the coaching, really. We'll sort of try to help you with that, but yeah. Here's an interim. I, I'm walking away from this conversation today thinking, what did our listening audience get? Do they have any tactical kind of things they can take away? And I what I keep thinking, Andy, is this is such a complex and nuanced discussion yes. and profession that there is no single silver bullet. That's right. It's multiple yes. things combined. It's situational. You better understand the context. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges, and this is my biggest pet peeve of today's social media, podcasting, crazy um, environment, everybody's got an answer. They're like, and I'm going to charge you $49 a month, and I'm going to tell you how to be a great enterprise salesperson. Just pay me $49 a month. And 
it's one size fits all. I think it's one of the, and then I was on one of the <laughs> private Patreons and yeah. I'm listening to some of the commentary. And these are people with one, two, three years of experience who are just starving for good advice. Yes. They're hungry to learn. And the people they're following more often than not are giving maybe not always bad advice, but non-context or environmental appropriate advice. And it's a big issue for our industry, Andy. I, that's the, if I could somehow fix that, I'd be so happy. <sighs> yes, that's, it's a big issue. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I was shaking my head. I think this was past weekend. Somebody had written a post, somebody with a following saying, look, Here's the thing, is if you just commit yourself to learning every day and trying to improve every day and getting better, that you'll reach a point before too long where sales becomes as easy as, I think the term was slicing a hot knife through butter. And I'm sitting there going, oh my God, first of all, <laughs> Sales is never easy. It doesn't matter how much you learn. Sales may become simpler, right? You may have a better understanding of what's happening. And I use the analogy with like uh, when athletes get drafted from college sports, they go into the pros and they say, what's the big adjustment period? Well, the game was so fast. But now as they've gotten more experience and I have a better understanding, it's slowed down. That's, that's what you want to, that's what you're aiming for, right? You know, if you listen to people who tell you, look, you keep learning, learning, and learning. It's just become so easy. It's like, no, sales is never easy. I mean, you're a competitive business. You've got competitors that are out to win. You're out trying to win. But it will become simpler. You have a better understanding of what's going on, of the context of what you need to do in the context of certain situations. That's what you want to try to – that's why you want to keep learning. That's why you keep getting more at-bats and more experience. So, yeah, that drives me nuts when people say, yeah, it's going to be easy. Don't worry. Just you keep learning. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it, it's just so wrong. Um, but, I, but on the other hand, I just make a point, though, to your point. On the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm not as quick to judge some of the advice that's out there, even though I just criticized this person, um, is that, you know, to your point earlier, selling is so individual, right, that, that I believe there's – not one method. If we've got 5 million salespeople in the United States, there's 5 million methods of selling. And, and this is the point about sort of breaking out of the, the, the pattern, the compliance-oriented methodologies we use today is that, yeah, some of this advice is going to resonate. You might not like or I don't like. It's going to resonate with somebody. It's going to help somebody. right? It may help a small segment of people that it resonates with, but it may help them. And so I'm I'm glad there's this big marketplace of ideas out there on LinkedIn. Again, like you, I don't agree with a bunch of it, but I can also see that there maybe is an audience from some of it. And that's the beauty about the social media platform that exists like LinkedIn is that people can get access to it, that they wouldn't get access to that before. And I, maybe I'm sensitive to it because, yeah, I've never, throughout my career, I've always felt like, sort of an unconventional, non-conventional, untraditional salesperson. You know, liberal arts major, but I had no idea of going into sales. Got early into tech sales, sometimes very complex technical sales. I, yeah, I'm not a salesy type person, right? And this is not my personality. They wanted to fire me after my first job, after my first training session, <laughs> a two-week training session away from that the training center to come back because I wasn't salesy enough. I was too analytical. And so I've always thought, okay, well, I've got a certain perspective and, and bent to it. This is my own. So I was fortunate to have bosses that encouraged me. But I know if I'd been in a completely different environment, I would have been out of sales, you know, early on. So I think, yeah, yeah I like, I want to encourage this, this individuality and the growth of the individuality. And I appreciate the fact that there's this, I said, this marketplace of ideas out there that people can choose from. I do think people have to be careful and yeah. what they do consume. It's a, it's a little bit like, you know, fake news and what our news media has done, right? And then individuals who like a particular narrative, they choose that news outlet for almost all their news. And they don't get other perspectives, right? Yeah. And I think the same danger is happening here. But, you know, I always like to try to leave like two or three solid ideas. Sure. So I'm sure we've done that, but go ahead. If you're an early career sales professional, right, my first bit of advice is, 
identify mentor or mentors Mm -hmm. that you can have those more personal one-on-one context-based discussions to say, here's a situation I'm in. Do you have, have you had similar experience? What do you advise? So that's number one. And it does not need to be a manager just to let people know and probably shouldn't be a manager. Uh, It could be a peer. It could be a, a manager of another group of people that you don't work for, but I agree. You have to seek a man, seek out a mentor. Number two, in, in a sports analogy, right? So the reason that Michael Jordan was such a wonderful basketball player wasn't just his God-given talent. It was the repetitions he did in practice, mm-hmm. both structured practice and out of structured practice. And that's another thing I would tell I tell all the early career professionals I work with is let's role play that situation. Let's do it once, twice, three times. Let's role play the presentation that you're going to do based upon the situation and the personalities of the people you're presenting to in that buying committee. And let's do it one or two times. It's okay to invest a couple hours to practice the presentation Mm -hmm. to make it much more effective. So practice, practice, practice. And third is be a student not only of your profession, but of your industry. Always be looking every day to learn one thing that's new, whether it's one new piece of advice or technique. It may not be for you, but learn it and decide which ones you're going to apply and practice and practice. So those are my three bits of advice for the early career sales professional. Yeah, I love it. I mean, to the second one, I'd add visualization. I'm big visualization. Uh, You know, in sales calls, you don't always have a chance to rehearse and role play a sales call. So, but you do have time to visualize how you think it's going to roll out. Anticipate the what ifs, right? The customer, what's the customer say I'm going to say? What questions will they ask? What would your responses be? Be deliberate about going through that visualization and, and thinking through how you'll respond and the questions you're going to ask and so on. Um, and yeah, to your point, yeah, always be, oh, the third point, always be learning, be a student. Um, there's, there's no substitute. And, and I'll take it a step further. Is the best thing I think you can do to become a student is to read. And I don't mean just articles. I don't mean LinkedIn posts, books. You know, books are still the best way, I believe, as do scientists, to, to, to transfer knowledge. So you know, always have a book at hand that you're reading. That, uh, I think as Brian Tracy said, you know, if you read a book a month, after a year, you'll be at the top 1% of your field. And I I believe that's true. I agree. In fact, this is lean analytics, right? Mm -hmm. When I read a book like this probably every two weeks or um, Measure What Matters from John Deere talking about OKRs and what Andy Grove did. So Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I'm not a big fiction reader. I love kind of business and kind of documentary type um, books. So I be a student, always be learning. In fact, it's funny, Andy. I used to, when I first became a sales manager, I used to show Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, <laughs> right? Not the yes. whole movie, but right. you know, scenes, right? A, A, B, B, C closing. Yeah. Now I modified that about 10 years to, to my ABL advice, A, always, B, B, L learning, always be learning right. and control your own destiny. Well, and that's, that's the key, right? Is you do control your own destiny at that point. Absolutely. And if you want, just closing thought, just draw, <laughs> finish the circle here is if you want to be able to have more control over your destiny, more control over how you sell, have more autonomy in the way that you conduct your business, you're going to have, it's going to be coming from a base of learning, right? You're going to be able to apply that learning in a way to make you more effective and more productive. So, yeah, keep doing it. In fact, I read another Gartner research report just the other day that said buyers 74% of the time will buy from the sales professional who first gave them insights or knowledge they didn't have before. Not about your product, but about the process that you're trying to help improve. And there's a reason for that. We'll just finish with with this because this this goes back to science. Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winning economist, research on how companies do and people make decisions. So there's certain types of decision makers. Most prominent one is called satisficers. And satisficers will research a problem and solutions until they find one that satisfies the requirements and is sufficient to meet their goals. The satisfice, the conjunction of satisfy and suffice. So 
I believe, my experience has shown me, and I've researched also from some quarters has shown this, that what customers are trying to do is when they're in their buying journey, they're trying to quickly gather information to make a good decision with the least investment of the time and resources possible. So back to the Gartner thing. If you are the one that provides them that insight first, they're done. That's good. That works for us. That's the satisfied decision. That's the good enough decision. And that's, you know, a guy won a Nobel Prize based on, <laughs> on research into that. So it makes well, a lot of sense why that's the case, yes. I just accomplished my goal for the day. I learned one new thing, satisfied, and I'm going to go start applying that. Andy, thank you for having me on today. It's been a great conversation. For me. Ray, it's a pleasure to talk with you as always. Hopefully everybody enjoyed this as well. And if people want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Um, it's Ray Reich at RevOpsquared.com. But I think LinkedIn, and it's just Ray Reich or at Ray Reich on Twitter or LinkedIn are great ways to contact me. Excellent. All right, Ray, thanks a lot. And you have a great one. Thank you. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I'm so grateful for your support of this show. And I want to thank my guest, Ray Reich, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can do all that on your phone in less than a minute as soon as this episode is over. So thank you for your help. And as always, thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Hi, friends. I have something really exciting to share with you. We're launching a new podcast called the RevOps Podcast as part of the Ring DNA podcast family. Today's leading B2B companies are embracing revenue operations as the answer to misaligned people, processes, and data that lead to recurring sales inefficiencies. However, many people still have critical questions about RevOps. What processes and tools do I need? How do I structure my team? How do I measure outcomes across sales, marketing, and customer success? And what are the best practices for doing that? So join Jordan Henderson, Jonathan Stevens, and Brandon Redlinger, and some of the world's leading revenue operations leaders as they tackle the important questions many of you face today when building a RevOps function. From Ring DNA, the company that transforms sales teams into high-performing revenue drivers, comes a podcast guaranteed to go beneath the surface-level conversations and dive deep into the world of RevOps. Your hosts deliver unfiltered, thought-provoking discussions and actionable takeaways on every episode about the ideas, processes, and technology changing the B2B sales landscape. Visit ringdna.com slash RevOps to learn more or subscribe now on your favorite podcast player. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to Qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more.